Hello, my name is Vito L. Mergulo. Where and when were you born? Born in 1919 in Ellsford, New York. So how old are you right now? 99. Do you feel like you're 99? <laughs> yes. Physically, what is it like to be 99? It's unbelievable. It's a surprising and wonderful experience. What branch of the military were you in? United States Marine Corps. And what specific units were you attached to during your time overseas? VMO 251, I was been overseas twice. So that was the first time was with VMO 251. The second time we came back from the, to the United States to reorganize VMF 113. And that was the second squadron of the Corsairs and we were, took part of the Marshall Islands campaign. What does VMO stand for and what does VMF stand for? Having an air, airplane with Marines and O stands for observation. They originally designed the airplane to fly observation missions in Australia against the Japanese, but when the, when the war started, they had to convert the VMO to VMO F, F, F. It became a fighter squadron. Yeah, they got to remember, we were just starting the war. The Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, and we weren't even organized yet. We, I was transferred from the East Coast to California to the Naval Air Station in San Diego. We started with zero airplanes. They didn't have barracks for us. We were set up in a hangar. That's where we slept. And then there was only about four or five officers and about 20 enlisted men. No airplanes, no equipment, no nothing. When we started the war, we were very weak in manpower and aircraft power. We were very fortunate to recover. It took time. The battles in Corregidor, the Philippines, was delayed in action, very expensive in manpower lives, but it gave the United States time for the factories to reorganize and switch to production of war materials such as airplanes, tanks, trucks, cars, and all that equipment we didn't have. Big mistake the United States has repetitively made to weaken the, the military de defenses and then helps encourage somebody that wants a world power, such as the Hitler, Mussolini, and, and Japanese. What was your specific job in the Marine Aviation Squadron? To maintain the airworthiness of the airplanes. And take me through that. What does that entail? Well, make sure that the engine was performing at top horsepower and that the controls were reliable and in good condition. And to support the pilot in every way we could to give them a top-notch aircraft. And what kind of planes were you servicing? Well, the first ones were practically World War I airplanes. They were biplanes made of fabric and wood. Then 
when Pearl Harbor was attacked, we were given Grumman's. They were mid-wing aircraft monoplanes, all metal instead of fabric and wood. And then the second time that we went overseas, we went over with the Corsairs, a very good airplane, powerful, with about 3,000 horsepower engine, plenty of speed, plenty of power. It was a very good aircraft. Tell me about the kind of damage that these planes would have uh, and how you and the ground crew would fix the damage that the fighter pilots had uh, attained while they were fighting the Japanese planes. Well, since the Japanese plane was a faster airplane, more maneuverable, it had an advantage over the American airplane. The American plane had very good production and it was made with better material. It could withstand uh, heavy combat losses. I, one, of the, one time, one of my airplanes came back with a hole right behind the pilot's head with a 20 millimeter cannon shell and it exploded. Luckily for him, we had heavy steel armor plating in that area and under his seat. The Japanese had no protection like that. And another thing is the Grumman, even though it was slower and not as maneuverable, it could withstand a lot of heavy combat losses, such as bullet holes and self-sealing tanks. If a bullet penetrated the gas tank, uh, the gas would interact with composition and the tank liner and swell up and seal itself. Seal itself. Japanese didn't have that. And another very important tactic that the pilots used, if the Jap was on their tail, they would nose over and dive deep in a very steep dive and pull out, subjecting the wings to a very heavy GI or gravity stresses, and the wings would be able to take them. Well, when the Japanese pilot tried to pull out of the dive, many times their wings would collapse and break. So there was advantages and disadvantages to all kinds of aircraft. Can you take me through the different islands that you saw action on during the war, sir? Well, Guadalcanal. I was on the, also assigned originally with VMO 251 on the island of, of uh, Espiritu Santa and the Hebrides Island, but there was no, no contact with the Japs there. The closest was the Guadalcanal, uh, part of the Solomon Islands group. And that the reason I got there, as I told you before, the RCO got uh, a request for a reinforcement. But he wanted pilots and airplanes, and my CO didn't want to give them up because it's hard to get equipment and manpower. So he sent us four mechanics. And when I arrived at Guadalcanal and reported for duty to the CO, he says, I don't need mechanics, I need pilots and airplanes. But he says, just go in and help everybody. So we operated practically by ourselves without any officer, command or anything. I was a senior private of the four. So I would take my men and we'd help the squadron mechanics. But the reason we were there till December, from August, September, October, November, December. And I served with three or four different squadrons. I forget the, the numbers and all. But they would be relieved on a monthly basis 
one month's combat there in Guadalcanal, they would be relieved and a new squad would come in. And since we were on detached duty, we were not relieved. We stayed and worked with the new squadron, four of them. As a matter of fact, we even helped the Navy squadron that came in that was off a carrier, a U.S. carrier, had been sunk and, and they made it to Guadalcanal. The pilots came in with about four or five airplanes and a couple of men to help them. So we attached ourselves to them and uh, helped the Navy pilot mechanics keep their airplanes in good shape. So, Besides Guadalcanal, what other islands did you serve on? The Marshall Islands campaign. Uh, the, that was a, later on in, in the war, we were strong, we had good airplanes, we had good personnel, and we were able, we were winning, we were beating the Japanese more frequently because we had more power than them. At the beginning, we were losing because we were so damn weak. A mistake the United States has made too many times, and I'm afraid they're going to make the same mistake now. We have potential enemies such as Russia and China, which, according to the Communist Manifesto, is world domination. Make no mistake about it, they, they intend to do it. And we should keep a strong military force, even though many in the U.S. don't feel like military spending is a waste, there's nothing in return. And the compa what I would like to suggest that and a very serious error that was d done in World War One, in World War Two, and in the present battles now. We've got to keep the U.S. military strong and also monetarily. So I did help on the campaign in the Marshall Islands. I helped, I was on the second wave in attacking the Japanese on the little island called Njibi. I spent one year there, but the Japanese were so well beaten by us that uh, that was an easy service, comparatively speaking. They never attacked us bombed us or shelled us, which was very easy. And our pilots would fly up in the slot and attack the Japanese strongholds. So that was, a, that was easy. Then I was sent back to the United States after that and assigned to a squadron and they decided to build a aircraft carrier Marine Corps or because the Marine pilots felt they were not given the opportunity to shoot down more Japanese airplanes than the Navy pilots. And I was assigned to this new idea to organize uh, aircraft carrier operation. And the war came to an end and it was never completely in in integrated. That's about the end of it. Could you please tell me, uh, as a mechanic, out in, in Guadalcanal, in early, uh, in, during the beginnings of the battle, uh, what all equipment did you all have to service the planes? What kind of equipment were you using? Mostly manually. Give me some examples, please. If the plane was damaged real serious, it was put in an area where you use for parts and not, not flying. But time, like one time, one of the airplanes came down was 
damaged and we couldn't get it off the runway. We had to lift the airplane by manpower to take it out of the way of the runway. And we were getting low on food as well as war material because the Japs were very strong naval forces, especially right after Pearl Harbor being attacked and sunk a lot of our ships. If, if, if there was a big part such as the wing or tail service, we would take it off of the damaged airplanes in our reserve area and take the part off of that and put it on the airplane that was in good flying condition except for, the, for that part. Tell me about your living conditions overseas. Well, we lived in army tents, army bunks, and oh, especially in Guadalcanal, there was so machine Charlie, that was a Japanese airplane, would take off at night more effectively to keep us awake, because if you heard the airplane up there, you'd have to get out of your bunk and into a foxhole because they drop a bomb every once in a while. So we call them sewing machine Charlie. But uh, I remember one night I thought I heard someone, because we were right near the jungle, and I thought I heard someone walking around outside and I woke up one of my men and told him to take his gun and watch and keep an eye on the tent and the entry that if anyone tried to come in, just shoot him. Because you couldn't have time to wonder whether they were an enemy because our men were not supposed to be walking around at night. And then fortunately, I got the men out of bed and the Japanese had just started to shell us. And we all jumped into a foxhole while the shells were exploding all around us. That, that kind of stuff happened quite frequently. Were there ever any casualties from the shelling? Yeah, critical casualties, but not that I experienced myself. A lot of, a lot of men were killed. There was one, one night where we were sustaining a heavy bombardment from Japanese battleships just outside the range of our shore guns. And they had an airplane up above spotting for them, telling them the, how to shoot to hit the airplanes and the ammunition dumps and things like that. We, we, we sustained it, a continuous bombardment starting around 7 o'clock at night, and after about two hours of continuous bombardment, the, there was about five men in the same hole, foxhole, and we all started start shaking very bad because of the continuous explosions. And I felt that it was something I had to do and since I couldn't militarily do anything effective against such big government, I started to pray, Our Father, O Lord in heaven, all the way through the prayer. Nobody kidded me, or, but the miracle about it is that we all stopped shaking. That it was after two hours of continuous bombardment. And after the shaking stopped, we still sustained all the way to about four o'clock in the morning, another seven hours of continuing, and we never start shaking again, which I feel is a miracle because to change from one condition, five men, and we all stopped shaking. Because you were praying. Afraid, I think, afraid and mad that you could not do something to 
protect yourself or counterattack. There's nothing you can do but stay in that hole. But, but ex tell me again, what were you? What did you do? You said you were playing our father. I was praying. I had to do something. I couldn't do anything militarily. So you were praying. So, so I was praying, and nobody kidded me about it then, nor the next morning. Did they join you in praying? No, but they all stopped shaking. So whether you believe in religion or miracles is beside the point. That's something that really objectively happened. And I w witnessed it and took part in it. It's unbelievable I realized that. I believe you. So it's a matter of faith in each person judges his, himself based on his experiences, I guess. But how, how else do you explain the fact that five men, God knows who, whether they believed in God or religion or not, but they all reacted the same way, just like I did. So it's not psychologically. You could, if I was the only one who had stopped shaking, and the others continued, then you could say it was a mental psychology. But when five men all shaking like leaves in the wind, and then all of a sudden they stop and never start again, even though we, we sustained it, a continuous shelling for hours after. And that which, by the way, leads of course, the next morning we got out of the hole uh, when the Japanese left. And to check our airplanes, I was checking the airplanes, and a Japanese had pulled a, a cannon up on the hill, was shelling us from the hill. And that's when we all jumped into holes again to protect ourselves, except myself and my, one of my mechanics. We stayed above ground inspecting the airplanes to find out if they were airworthy or not. And my, one of my men got two or three airplanes into the air, and I got two or three planes in the air. And we had, the reason we walked around with the shells falling around us because those airplanes meant a lot, and we had to get them in the air to find that damn gun, which they did, and within about 15, 20 minutes after we got those airplanes in the air, the shelling stopped, and that's why we, both my man and I, were given the Silver Star Station. We saved the airplanes, we saved the men, and we saved the particular battle. Well, it was an, it was an artillery gun. I think it was what they, they said that when they got there and checked it, it was a gun off a ship that we sank, a Japanese ship, because we had very little ground that we controlled, and the, fr the front lines were only a mile or two away from the airfield. And we had sunk when a Japanese freighter uh, two miles up the coast, so you could see it from the airfield. And they had taken the gun off that ship, dragged it up to the hill on the top, looking down on us at the airfield. And that's when they started firing. But everybody else stayed in hold, and my mechanic. One of my men and myself continued our inspections to make sure that the airplanes would fly in safely. And we got three or four between the both of us up airborne, which stopped the sailing. So it was important. I heard the next day that the commanding officer, his executive officer, and the senior medical officer, they had dug a, a trench, a foxhole, in the floor of their tent. And then they put armor plating on top of it to protect them. So they didn't even have to leave the tent. But unfortunately, one of the shells hit them, and all were killed with a direct hit shell. And they were about 40, 50 feet away from us. 
the next morning, uh, some some uh, the Marines were checking for damages and found the tent had been hit directly. Checking, they found the bodies of the commanding officer, executive officer, and senior medical officer. So you, no matter how much protection you have, there's very little protection against a direct shell hit. You can't protect yourself from that. So. Tell me, um, what was your first experience under the Japanese naval bombardments like? Do you remember the first time you were under the naval bombardments? Not the naval bombardment. When I was flying in to, on my assignment to Guadalcanal, we had landed. And we were getting out of the airplane. All of a sudden, I heard something going through the air. And the guys were jumping into holes. I told them that I had no battle experience and my men didn't have. So we were naively saying, asking, what's that all about? What's happening? They didn't answer. They just ran away and jumped <laughs> into a hole. So we, we repeated. That was my first exposure to combat. And it was a shell from a gun up on the hill. And so from then on, we knew whether what we called incoming mail or our going mail. Our going mail would be our guns firing at the Japanese. Incoming mail would be the Japanese firing at us. So we learned the difference real quick. When to jump into a hole and when not to. Then the Japanese ships came in around seven o'clock at night to start the bombardment. And it was a sustained Never stop, shells were falling all the time, except maybe for a couple of minutes where they were shifting the ships around or reloading. But uh, we had it was constant flow of shells. The shells were 16 inch shells. Uh, I don't know if you understand what that means. It carried 2,000 pounds of TNT in it. That's all about a, a ton of explosives. And the, a battle wagon has nine guns on it. And the broadside is when the ship is standing sideways facing the shore and firing all their guns at once. That's three stations. Nine guns with 2,000 pounds in each shell. And the impression I got to answer your question now, when they started to fall, and after a continuous bombardment, I felt that God had the world in his hands and was tearing it apart. And, I, and then I would hear a rumbling sound going out into the distance. And I thought it sounded like bombers, that they were going to bomb us as well. But I soon learned that it wasn't that. That was the echo leaving us. Normally when you hear an explosion, you hear the vibration coming towards you. But we were in the center of the explosion. And so the echo was reversed. The bomb would explode and the noise would travel away from us. I mean, what, I mean, what did it feel like when the shells would land? Terror, terror. That's the... That's the time I really started to feel afraid because you could feel the ground shake like thunder. To get, help you understand what, what the effect would be like, most of, most of you hearing this, I'm sure have experienced uh, a heavy thunderstorm. And, you, and if you, you've experienced a close explosion of a thunderstorm near you, you're pretty afraid. Just magnify that sound by number 10. 
And that's what it was like under those shells. Ten times the noise and be sustained for 89 hours about of continuous. That was a very terrorizing experience. And it, it couldn't do anything but thank God to, to, to survive that. I'll never forget that day. Did you ever see casualties of the men uh, who were being brought back from the front? No, I saw some of them, some of them that were, had been treated by uh, our emergency treatment centers that are on Guadalcanal, putting them on airplanes to fly them back to major hospital facility. But no, no, I didn't. Like I said, I was on a air, air part of the Marines, and the closest I came to hand in hand combat, it was one day that the Japanese broke through the front lines and were headed towards the airfield, and we were notified to get our guns and be ready to repel the attackers. But Fortunately for us, on the airfield, we have good Marines up there between us, and they inter inter interfered with the Japanese plans. They beat them and repelled them, so we didn't have to face, face them. Could you describe to me what the runways were like uh, on these on these different islands? Well, you got to remember the islands are made of coral, uh, and yeah, whatever jungles uh, they you had to tear the trees down, then the CBs, the navy construction gang would come in and level the field down as well as they could. As a matter of fact, one day I remember we were under attack from Japanese bombers and this CB, CB stands for Construction Battalion, and they many times it ended up making their own landings but the way it usually is planned, the Marines make the landings, and when the Marines secure the landing site, then the CBs come in, start construction of the airfield, cutting trees down, putting leveling them off, and hauling coral that would grind it up, break it up into small pieces, and put it on the runway. And this one day, the Japanese bombers are coming over, dropping bombs, and this CB is on a tractor, one hand out on the throttle, and he's ready to jump out. When the bombs came pretty close, he jumped off and, and saved himself. The, the CBs deserve a lot of credit for a job well done. How long would the runways be? Uh, a couple of thousand feet, I think. Would there be any air traffic control tower or anything? I mean, or was it just a strip? Just a strip, and usually maybe put, they would make a, build a little tower so that they could communicate with the pilot. But you got to remember the raw islands with nothing no equipment, no nothing. Tom, I mean, huh? Everything had to be done by hand. When one landing going into the Hebrides, we had to build our own landing dock, cut down palm trees, put them down into the surf, and then put a breastwork of logs and filled it in with coral. And when the materials from the ship was brought in, we'd have to unload by hand, 
heavy equipment, everything. I had nothing to help. So, they found out, of course, that coral is very sharp and it damaged the tires because uh, when landing, it would cut into the tires. They found out too also that sprinkling coral with salt water, the coral would come alive and start growing in like concrete. But the negative part is, remember, coral is sharp and cuts the hell out of your tires. So they found out that the thing to do is to use the dead coral. Where do you get dead coral? More inland than along the shore. Before we continue with your combat experiences, um, I just want to backtrack a little bit. You mentioned that you were born in New York? Yes. Did you grow up there? Yes. Where did you grow up? A little town called Silver Lake. Silver Lake is part of White Plains. What was your father's profession? He was a laborer. He, he was born in Italy and he came here to the United States when he was around 20. And he came from a very good family, but he was a playboy. He liked to do things, wasn't serious minded. So he didn't, didn't, have, didn't pay attention to his education. So when he came back, came to the United States, he had to work hand labor jobs. Did you have any brothers or sisters? Uh, two brothers, and both of them were in the war. One was a, a year younger. I'm the oldest of the three. And the one brother that was a year younger than I fought in Europe with Patton all the way into Czechoslovakia. The other brother was my, what I laughingly call my kid brother. And I still call him kid brother because he's 94. <laughs> That's some kid, 94. But he joined the Marine Corps also in, the, in aviation since he had worked building airplanes and he had a good background in it. And he became plane captain of a B-26. He flew all over the Pacific Ocean with his squadron. So the Murgillo family was well represented. And the one, the one person that I think deserves a lot of credit is American motherhood. The cost of the war, much heaviest on them, was my personal experience. When I went home on leave after being in combat, I, I experienced my mother being so frightened to watch the mailman coming up the walk to the house to deliver a letter because she had three sons in combat. And she was always afraid she would be going to get a note that one of her sons had been killed. And those who hear and witness this presentation, I want you to know that mothers should be awarded a lot of recognition that they don't get because they suffered a tremendous heart experiences living a living death. And so I want to make that comment and hope that to be more vis visible acceptance of the, the fact that I just mentioned, the heartbreak experience of suffering 
such a small thing as a letter to the carrier coming to your door. Tell me um, about your memories of growing up in the Great Depression. That was a, a very fast maturing experience. There was no childhood really. We had make a garden, go around picking up tires, steel things, sounds for junk. Doing things for yourself. I remember my father wanted for Christmas to get a bicycle for us. He went to the junkyard and found three bikes and put the parts together to make one good bike. Some of the kids, of course, the parents were working. Because even in the Big Depression, the government hires and has the big workforce there. They would, those kids would get nice presents. And that's what I remember. Were there other specific things that you saw or heard around you that really made you realize there's a Great Depression going on? Yeah, my, we were in a welfare program, and you, uh, they would, the government would give a hundred pound bag of flour so you could make your own bread and food. And when the shoes wore out, the holes on the bottom of your shoes, we used to put pieces of cardboard in there to keep our foot off the ground. And we could get the shoe repaired or replaced by going to the welfare office. And they would check to make sure that there was punched, that the bottom of the shoes was shot and they needed, we needed a replacement. Uh, before the war broke out, what were you planning on doing with your life? I was planning on becoming an aeronautical engineer because aviation was coming into being still in the development ages, it, was, it wasn't a very dependable vehicle. But something did occur during that time to, to prove what I'm saying. You've heard of Charles Lindbergh, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Well, he was flying across the Atlantic Ocean all by himself. I remember that following the radio announcements of where his progress was. And I'm going to backtrack on something about the war. Ties with Colonel Lindbergh. On the second squadron getting ready for the Marshall Island campaign, Colonel Lindbergh had come into our squadron to show the pilots a modified version of the course there. They were flying all day long. He showed them how to handle this modified airplane. And he got ready to leave around five in the evening. I asked him if I could start his airplane for him. Can you imagine that, me, a little boy who in the, in the Depression was listening to him about a hero that the world recognized, and I'm talking to him personally. He said, no, I'll do it. And he tried to start his airplane, and it wouldn't start. So I took off, took him out of the cockpit, and got some of them in to check some things, and I was checking another part, and I found what the problem was. That somebody was sabotaging, trying to kill him. They had put a, a part inside the magneto floating around freely, and all I had to do was to fall out across electrical contact and shut the engine off. I found it, took it out, put it, fixed it up, got in the cockpit and started it. Then it went to Colonel Lindbergh, like you and I, was here talking to each other. The world hero and a little boy from Silver Lake 
talking to a world hero. Was, to me, that was a heart-rendering memory I'll never forget. Did, did you tell him that you saved his life? No, I just told him that I fixed it and that somebody had put this part in it and it should be followed up somehow. And I turned the airplane over to him. I had to, to get, it, get him seated in the cockpit. Do you remember listening to, about his journey from Oh, here? yes. To, to tell me about that memory. Uh, every day he would listen to the radio announcements about he was so far across the Atlantic. He saw uh, Ireland. He was headed towards Paris. He landed. There was a wild crowd there. Thousands of people welcomed him. And they took his airplane and put it into a hangar. And then when he came back, he had one of the biggest parades in New York City was for him. He was a well-renowned hero because he was the first man to fly across the Atlantic by himself. There was two Englishmen who had done it, too, but they could relieve each other out of control. Lindbergh had fell asleep a couple times in the hall, almost crashed into the ocean. But he luckily awoke in time to correct his flight. It was a very spectacular performance, not only for him as a man, but also for the airplane, because airplanes were not that dependable in those days. So that's a very important memory I have of the war. What were the first few jobs you had growing up? When I graduated high school, the depression was in full swing. I couldn't find a job. I remember shaving, dressing up to go for a job. It was a very formal uh, effort. And necktie and everything, I was to, and all I was going to do was look for a car repair job, because I took majors in car re repairs in high school. And the answer I got from everybody, why should I hire you as a high school graduate when I have men here that have got 10, 20 years experience? Because the, the depression was very bad. My father said that there were men doing pick and shovel work next to him that were lawyers and doctors. So it was very deep effect uh, on a lot of people, real professional people who do manual labor. Very, that was a very sad experience. Sir, uh, how did you end up in the service? Well, about a year before Pearl Harbor, I had decided that America would be in the war because in Europe they were already fighting the war with Britain and France against Germany. And I knew uh, I had talked to men that served in World War I and they said they were drafted and sent into battle with very little training. And so since I was 20 years old, I knew I would be called and we would go to war, contrary to what the majority of Americans felt. They said, no, we're just staying away from Europe. I said, you can't. With Hitler and Mussolini taking up all the different countries and the Japanese taking China, I said, it's going to be a war for sure. So that's why I joined, to get training before I was, uh, when the war started. And I was right. 
How did you hear about the attack on Pearl Harbor? I was stationed in San Diego Naval Air Station, and I was uh, up here in Hollywood. I was invited for dinner uh, from people I knew from New York, and they wanted me. They invited me to, to come with a friend for dinner, and so we were in the, the, this person's home, having enough very fine dinner and a friendly meeting. And we got time to, around eight or nine o'clock to leave. And when we got on the street, people start shouting, you better go back to your base. The Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. And that's how I introduced to what was happening. So we hitchhiked back to San Diego and reported for duty at 10 o'clock at night. And once you got to the base, what happened? Well, the next morning we fought, fell out for accounting. We were assigned to help prepare some of the airplanes that we had to send them to Hawaii. Because remember, the air, air aviation part of our forces were decimated by the Japanese bombers. They lost all their airplanes. So all the airplanes that we had were being prepared to be shipped out to Hawaii. That was pretty touchy service because we walked all the way through the night time and our airplanes were parked, parked out in the boondocks somewhere. And you go out there they had guards with Tommy submachine guns, and they would click, click, you'd hear a guy ram a rod, trying to hold two goes there. Friend, man, friend. <laughs> we kept on, so don't, don't, we're going to pick up an airplane. So there's so much uncertainty and excitement, anything could happen, as a matter of fact, it did. During the day, one day, a guy released a 500-pound bomb from the wing to the ground, accidentally. Luckily, it didn't go off. Another mechanic was working in the rear seat of a dive bomber, which has two seats, and there's a pilot and a gunner. And he had the guns in, mounted and fired a burst of machine gun fire right through his own tail. So things like that were happening all over the place. People were scared, men were, we didn't know what was going to happen. We fully were operating under the fear that the Japanese were going to land on the California coast because we heard how bad the bombing of Pearl Harbor was and why the Japanese didn't follow up with a landing either in Hawaii or the United States, I guess they just didn't know how well they had done their job. They had done a complete destruction of the Navy and the aviation. It was a terrible thing. I mean, what's that like to know that your country has been attacked? You were already in the service, so you know that you're going to war. That's I mean, right. I mean, what was that like? Well, being, being the, my feelings and thoughts and experiences were different than what the average guy was because I was already psychologically, psychologically prepared. I wasn't going through the shock that that the other fellows were going through, that were refusing to believe that we would be going to war. I was already mentally adjusted to that. Um, can you talk to me, going back to your time overseas, um, 
Did you ever see the Japanese casualties on any of the islands? Yes. T tell me about your memories of the, seeing the Japanese casualties, please. Well, when I am the pod, Wake Island, that I, uh, I was on the second wave of the assault to this little island of Njibi. And I have a little comical story to tell you. As I came ashore, I looked up on the shoreline, there was a chicken, not a feather on it, pecking away at the ground. The feathers that had been blown up by the shell explosion, I guess. And it looked so comical. But to balance that to a more serious thing, looking at the shoreline, I saw one of my comrades floating there, dead. And nobody was doing anything about it. So I stopped my the men in charge of me. I was in charge of, rather, to go get the body out of the service and bring it up on the shore above the high float mark so, so that they could properly take care of them later on. And then we continued marching into the island. So I had a comical experience and a serious experience. The next, it got dark, and the island had been devastated with, with our, our cruiser had shelled the island all night long. Well, it looked like a postcard, South Island heaven was now nothing but a flat piece of land with not one tree standing. All, all the vegetation had been blown apart. And to show how silly it was, there was a little part of a tree about as thick as my thumb, and I got behind it for protection, because there no, was no sense in going any further in the dark. We were shooting at our own men. So the next morning, when the dawn came, one Japanese soldier or worker, I don't know what, stood up with his arms up, silhouetted with the sun behind him, giving himself up. And then we got him taken care of as a prisoner, and we continued, about 20 of us, marching across the island. And keep in mind that now there's nothing in the way the no hills, a very small, flat island. It was only a couple of miles long. You could walk around it in about a half hour. So we suddenly reached a point where somebody popped out of a hole in the ground and gave himself up. And for some damn reason or other, he got scared and started running away. And these 20 men all got up shooting the poor guy. I said, what are, you, what are you doing? Where the hell is he going to go? There was no place for him to hide. There was no hills, no vegetation. And the shoreline was only uh, five or six hundred feet away. He's going to run into the ocean. There was no place for him. But the uh, nervousness of Combat, I guess. But I couldn't see it. I didn't fire my gun. That's as close as I come to shooting at an enemy. Why didn't you fire your gun? I didn't see it as being necessary. He was all by himself, and he probably was a Korean worker. I don't think he was a Japanese soldier. He had nowhere else to go and nowhere else to hide. But the, the, the idea of killing, I guess, the, the, the controls your emotions, but I, I didn't. Not that I'm bragging about it, I'm stating a fact. 
I think, out of the way because I didn't try to kill someone when it wasn't necessary. I would have if it was necessary. Could you please tell me about the relationship between the ground crew and the fighter pilots when you all were in combat? Oh, you got to know each other. Always in the military sense, you always respected a commissioned officer. Because even, even as an enlisted man, this is titled for to me, my, my rank. I'm a non-com, and I'm a non-commissioned officer. I am an officer of the Marine Corps, but non-commissioned. We are considered as an officer. Mm. Non-com, non not commissioned. So, tell me about the relationship between the fighter pilots and the ground crew. They knew that the, their lives depended upon the ground crew doing a good job so they have a dependable aircraft. There's enough danger flying and combating without having uh, non interested mechanic, uh, especially just like the ground troops and infantry. Infantry guys sometimes have shot American officers in combat because they were so be so mean. While fighting is going on, it's easy to do. But I'm saying, I mean, did did you know these pilots first name basis? Were you no, friends? No, 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 first name. Sir, always a sir. No, in the military sense, you have to maintain a respect for a rank. Mr. Mergolo. Can you please take me through, in as much detail as possible, um, the incident that led to you receiving the Silver Star? Yes. The Japanese had taken a gun from a sunken trader ship of theirs and brought it up into a hilly spot looking down on the airfield. And after the big heavy shelling of the night previous, we tried to check our aircraft for airworthiness. And the Japanese up on the hill with their naval gun started firing on the airfield. Shells were dropping around where the airplanes were, and about 20 or 30 men were working on them. As soon as the shells started to erupt, everybody jumped into hold, foxholes. One of my men and I continued inspecting the aircraft for damage and the possibility of airworthiness. He found a couple, got them started, and got past to take them up. And I did the same thing by getting the airplanes air, airborne and getting a, a point to a, find the, the gun helped a lot because 15 or 20 minutes after we was su su successful in getting these airplanes in the air, they spotted the gun emplacement of the Japanese and took care of the problem and the shelling stopped. This saved the pair airplanes that were still airworthy and safety of the men involved. And because of this, we won that particular engagement and saved the airplanes, which stopped the gun from firing down on the airfield and made it 
the Japanese attempt a failure. When you all were going to the different planes to check them for damage, what was going on as you were looking at the different planes? Well, the Japs kept firing as long as there were no airplanes sighting them. That's why it was important to get the airplanes airborne. While my man and I would continue to our airworthiness check of the airplanes and the procedure of getting the airplanes airborne, the shells continued to land all around us. So when the airplanes got airborne and the gun was spotted, the pilots took care of the problem and eliminated the gun firing. Well, how severe was this bombardment? It wasn't in any ways near the severity of the night before because there's a big difference in the size of the gun involved. The, we were being hit on the airfield with a three-inch naval gun, whereas during the night we were being hit by uh, 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 Navy big ships with 16-inch shells. Big difference. Were there any casualties from this? Not that I know of. Some of the aircraft were damaged by shrapnel from the, the exploding shells. But the ones that we okayed were all right. That's why we made an inspection before we would release an airplane. When it when 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 you taxied the airplane, where were the airplanes before they were on the runway? The airplanes were on the side of the runway, in what we call revetments, kind of like a parking space, and. From there, I got the airplane started. I taxied over to the side of the runway towards where it looked like there was some piles. I saw one, one, one person walking toward me. I yelled down to him, are you a, a pilot? He said, yes. I said, well, take this airplane and get up there and find that SOB and take care of it. And he did that. Um, while, while I have you here, can you explain to me the importance of Henderson Field? What was Henderson Field? That was the... Henderson Field. Henderson Field was another name that they called in honor of a Marine that was killed in Wake Island. So that, but Henderson or Cactus, therefore, is synonymous. Oh, is that the same airfield you were on? That's the same airfield, yes. Well, you're going to laugh at this. Those airplanes didn't have a, a right, normal starter. They had one that started with a shotgun shell. Uh-uh. You had to open up the breech and then like a, a shotgun, you, know, you had these paper shells. You put the shell in, close the breech, go in the cockpit and throw a switch and electricity, a shock is sent to the shell and it explodes and the expanding gases from the shell go down to a, a unit mounted on the engine and turns it. So the chemical, it, it really adds to the difficulty that my man and I had because by, we were starting the airplane by ourselves. So we had no one to put the shells in the starter breach. We had to get out of the cockpit, climb on the side of the engine, put the shell in, the, in get back in the cockpit, and then engage the starter. And then if it didn't catch, 
we have to get out and we had to do one other, one other thing to make sure that the engine didn't get engaged in the liquid lock of the cylinder. We had to turn the propeller by hand with the switch, ignition switch off, of course. And then I had to get out on the ground, turn the propeller around by hand two or three times to make sure that there's no oil or liquid in that I would cause the damage to the engine. Then climb up on the side of the engine, put the shell, shotgun shell in there, close it, get in the cockpit, and then fire. Well, hopefully it starts. I also tried and was not successful in starting a couple of other airplanes. What made it unsuccessful? When I f fired the shell to engage the starter, the engine didn't, ign ignition did not occur. Just like you start in your car, you turn the switch on, but if the, if the ignition doesn't work, it's not going to start the engine. When the shelling first started, we were amongst the other men checking the airplanes, getting cleared for flight from the previous night bombardment by the Japanese. Um. How many shells, I mean, was it just a shell here and there, or was it like multiple shells would be falling at one time? No, it was a single gun that, that I understand, so that it would have to be intermittent. When the shelling started, everyone ran for cover, except my man and myself. We continued to inspect the airplanes. What was the reason you guys didn't go for cover? I don't know, you have to ask my man, but the reason I didn't, there was one thing in my mind, and that was to get those airplanes in the air. Did you have any communication with this other man, or you no. both individually decided to stay? Individual. When they, everybody jumped for a hold, I was in the middle of inspecting an airplane and kept to going with the inspection. Explain to me, I mean, why did you feel that it was more important to get these planes in the air than to go somewhere for your safety? The same reason you would if a guy was shooting at you and you had a way of defending yourself, you would defend yourself first. And getting those airplanes in the air was, was necessary to stop that gun. Going back just overall about your time overseas, were you ever strafed by Japanese fighter planes? Yeah, in Guadalcanal, one day, some silly Japanese pilot decided to fire on the runway. What the hell was it going to hit? Because all the airplanes were gone. and. Uh, Runway was lined with 30 and 50 caliber machine guns. And while he came down right through the center of the runway, to firing at the ground, he must have been crazy. With all of his guns on the side of the runway, 30 to 50 fired. There's a wall of, of machine gun fire he went through, and he got hit naturally. and continued into the hillside. I went to the, the next day to the site where the airplane crashed, and there was a big hole with the engine barred down into it. As a matter of fact, I even took a one shell as a souvenir. Was the pilot still there? Are you kidding? He was part of the ground. He went full speed right into the hill. Did you see it hit the hill the day before? No. I saw him approach it, yes. But I didn't see the impact.
but I saw the results of it. What did uh, the plane look like? It was all, all apart, it was all smashed. Full speed, right into the hill. The, the Jasper bomb got a canal almost every day with about 20 bombers flying up at around 30,000 feet, 25 to 30,000 feet. And our planes would need about an hour because, like I told you, they were not very powerful, the Grumman's. It would take our Grumman fighter planes almost an hour to take off and reach 25, 30,000 feet. And hopefully by that time, the Japanese bombers would come in and the Grumman's would be above them and make a pass at the bombers. And if they killed, shot them, fine. If not, they kept on going because, like I said, they were not very good combat planes as far as maneuverability. Do you ever remember seeing any of the dogfights above? Oh, of course. Tell me your memories of the dogfights that were going on. I remember one day when our fire planes were, through, I would guess, around 30,000 feet, and the bombers were at about 25,000 feet, and the anti ground anti anti-aircraft guns quit firing at the bombers when they came over the field because our airplanes would then attack the bombers and they would keep on diving on down. That's saying that it's a dogfight. Now well, one day an anti-aircraft shell must have hit a bomber and I could see the wing coming down like a, a leaf. It had broken off the, from the bomber. That was one experience I saw, Japanese bomber. And uh, one, of, one of the anti ground aircraft guns must have hit it and ex must have exploded near the butt of the wing and it seared it and the wing came from floating down. Then another day on a fighter strip, one of our pilots had a Japanese on his tail. And he had, dealt, like I told you, one of the defense mechanisms that our pilots did instead of dogfighting was to dive for the ground. And the Japanese would follow, picking up a lot of speed. When he got down to the ground, the Marine pilot would pull his airplanes out of the dive. The Jap would follow, but his wings would come apart fly off the airplane. And I saw, the, I could see the tracer bullets going into the Marines' airplane. And they, they must have been about five or six, six hundred feet only, very, real close. Did you see the Japanese wings come off? No, because by the time they pulled out, they were, they were doing probably about 300 miles an hour. Um, did you have any other experiences? No, that's the only ones I did. What did it look like when the Japanese bombers would get hit by the anti-aircraft fire? Well, they didn't always catch fire. They would just start circling around going down. Did you have any experiences against Japanese booby traps? No, like I said, the hand in hand fighting and getting close with the Japanese, being in aviation, being on the airfield all the time, didn't have those personal contacts. Um, you being a mechanic, were there times that some of the Marine fighter pilots went up in the air and they came back because of mechanical issues? Not because of the enemy fire, but something was going wrong with the plane? I'm sure it, it, it did happen, but I never experienced it. The Japanese fleet firing at us would light up the whole horizon. It would be like a sunrise. You, you got to remember, they were firing broadsides. That's nine 
cannons flying all at once were powerful. The Japanese battle wagons and cruisers fired. The flashes were down at sea level, and we were far away from them. But the horizon itself would light up from the flashes on the, at sea level. What advice do you want to give to future generations? That's a difficult thing because every day is a different day with different factors involved. You have your basic strengths of moral ethics and try to maintain that as possible. But don't be a damn fool and that someone take your country away from you. Stay strong. It's a, a, a expensive, but like you're driving a car, you buy insurance for that car. That's a, a expensive. Do you get anything from it? No, not a thing. Unless something happens and then the insurance cuts in. And it's the same thing with the uh, nation and the defense. You have to have a strong military to make it very sure in any other country's ideas about taking it. Stay strong. Stay. Don't lose your values, moral and ethics. Try to operate within those frameworks if possible. Were you afraid of getting killed when you were in the war? No, I just, like every, every soldier, sailor, marine, knows that when he puts a uniform on, he might be killed. That we, that's something I think is in everyone's mind. But the difference is, the way I put it, I only want to die once. So it's not being a hero. It's something that could happen, but maybe will never happen, which in my case was true. The closest I came to death in serving in the Marine Corps was after I came back from the Guadalcanal campaign. I came down with malaria. I, I was up to 106 degree temperature. The doctor said I should have been dead, died, because at 106, you will die. And I was headed for a date in Hollywood. I told him, I said, I'll check back tonight when I come back. He said, no, you're not. He says, I'm giving you an order. You're not going out. You get, you get, turn yourself in and get undressed and go to bed. Uh, which I did, and as soon as I was put in bed, I went out, and for two weeks I was a dead Marine. I was deep coma, kept alive by intravenous feeding. And two weeks later, my eyes opened up, and there was a Navy nurse sitting there. She said, you have had a nurse sitting next to you 24 hours a day because you were supposed to die, but I didn't. That was another miracle I experienced. It wasn't a bullet, but it was just as effective as a bullet. What does it feel like when you have malaria? The symptoms? Well, sometimes you'll be shaking like a feather. Other times you'll be breaking out in the sweat. And there's different kinds of malaria attacking you in different ways. Some of it hits you mentally. Some of the guys would actually be strong enough to pull a, a sink out of the wall. Or some of the guys would put their fingers in electrical socks, sockets and blow the fuses. And if a guy stopped getting combat, combative, 
he would start fighting with his friends. It would take three or four or five guys to hold one, one sick Marine. He just go berserk. But I survived. Because you need, all, all the World War II combat veterans need to stick around as long as possible so that people can learn from them. You know? That part is, uh, I agree with so, And that's why I'm talking to you. Not, not because I'm going to get any notoriety. I don't want that. I want, uh, uh, I'm hoping and praying the results of this meeting with you is that I will awaken in the minds of people those two lines, I'll keep repeating it. Military strength to, to be used for defensive purposes and protection of our way of life and economy. Because you need the economy to support the, the military. And you need the military to protect your economy or way of life. There will always be, as the Bible says, wars or rumors of wars. Seems to be a weakness in the human being. What do you believe happens after a person passes away? I, I can't give you a specific answer, but I have a strong feeling that there is an afterlife of some sort, what do you call it, or what it would be like, I don't know. I can't believe that God would have us all born, striving through a lifetime of struggles, and then like walking off a cliff into nothing. There's got to be a continuation of some sort. What it is or how it is, I don't know. Nobody ever came back to tell us. No will they, I guess. But you, you can rest assured that there will always be a reckoning of some coming. But you believe that there's a higher being, like God? Oh, absolutely. How can you explain the universe and everything in it? What would you want to say to all the men who were killed in the war? God bless your souls, and you did what you could. Hopefully, if you did some wrongs, pray to God for, for forgiveness. Because we do things sometimes under stress that we normally wouldn't do. What kind of person do you want to be remembered as? Someone that was tried to be a, a positive effective and make life a little better for everybody that I contacted with just like I do with any youngsters. That's one thing that I'm a retired teacher uh, at the junior college level, teaching aviation. And I felt uh, get, given a wonderful opportunity to help these young people know what is good and what is bad. Like I had a rule, I always told them, one thing I want you to keep in mind that when you work on an airplane and fix it, as you walk away, you should feel confident. If you were thinking about it, you go back and do the job over again. Always work that you did the right thing.